Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Hey, guys. Hi. Heading to Moosehead. I don't know how long, maybe four days, maybe a week. Maybe, maybe even seven days. Have a good time. Watch out for the alligators. I will. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. See you soon. Bye. What's up, guys? I am back at it again. Heading onto the ice for another week, maybe less, maybe more, of winter camping and ice fishing. And this time, I'm going to the headwaters of the famous Kennebec River. I'm going to the biggest mountain lake in the entire Northeast United States at 75,000 acres, 120 square miles. I'm going to the world famous Moosehead Lake, going after some big native brookies and some huge togue. I'm on the ride up here and the wind is blowing like a sieve. It is blowing straight sideways. The weatherman called for like 15 mile an hour winds and there's trees all over, there's drifts all over. It's blowing hard. Winter camping, ice fishing is a challenge in itself. And there are basically three things that make it way more challenging. The first one is extreme colds, talking below zero, just with the mercury, not even counting the wind chill. A lot of stuff freezes, the machines don't wanna start, all the batteries die for filming, and the ice holes freeze up and blah, blah, blah. Cold, 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 makes it a challenge. The next thing is slush. Slushy conditions on the ice makes it a serious challenge. When you get start getting stuck, things get wet, you can't move around, that makes for a pretty good challenge too. And then the third thing that can make for a real challenging trip is wind. And you add wind with those other two, and man, I'm not gonna say it takes the fun out of it, because I have a lot of fun no matter what, but it definitely makes it a serious challenge. And it also makes it a serious risk, brings some danger involved. Once you're like 10, 15 below zero, and then it starts blowing 40 miles an hour, then you got a little bit of problems to worry about. You gotta worry about exposure to your skin. You gotta worry about your gear, and you gotta worry about stuff freezing up. Pretty sure I'm gonna have at least two of the three things that's gonna make this trip even more challenging. One, I'm gonna have extreme colds. It, after today, where it is 18 degrees right now, after today, we're not gonna see above zero, I don't think, for the rest of the week. We're definitely gonna see a lot of wind. The weatherman's calling for 15 to 20 each day, mostly out of the north, northwest. So I'm gonna try to get set up with the trees block and set up on a part of the lake where I might not be seeing as much wind. Now that being said, tomorrow, of course, the wind's gonna blow out of the southeast. southeast. So tomorrow I might eat some wind, but after that it's gonna be north, northwest the rest of the week. So I'll try to be smart and set up away from that and try to find a good spot to fish. So Maine has a lot of really weird laws and a lot of different laws for whether it be open water season or ice fishing season for this lake, for that lake, the north zone, the south zone, this month, that month, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And Moosehead, there's like, it's half a book trying to find out the laws for this lake before coming up here. So I called my lawyer and I sent him over a copy of the laws for Moosehead Lake, where I can fish, where I can't fish, what I can keep, when I can keep it, what I can use for bait. He looked at it, read it all over. He just laughed and he said, good luck. And he also said, you owe me $700 for that. So I'm on my own here. I took the time and made a map of the lake and tried my best to figure out what areas are closed and what areas are open. I was planning on fishing Lily Bay. It looks like parts of Lily Bay is open and parts are not open, but the state is so vague. They say, look for a red board on a tree. Look for Henry Brognine or Henry Borgnine or I don't know, some guy's property. How the heck am I supposed to know where the heck Henry lives? How am I gonna find a tree? And then they got names for like, you can't fish in front of Moose Stream and Moose Brook and Moose Leg Horn and Moose Horn Leg and all this stuff. And I looked on Google Maps and most of them don't even show up. So I had to search out like five or six maps to find out where Moose Knuckle Cove is and Beaver Cove, which is actually a cove, and found those. So I drew a map of the off limits, what I think, and hopefully 
I do everything by the book here, which I always try to do, guys. Try to follow those game laws. Moosehead Lake has really come to the front ever since smallmouth bass were introduced in here about 20 years ago. The brook trout fishing was that eh, it was good, but now the brook trout fishing is unbelievable. Since the smallmouth bass have been introduced and taken over, you cannot argue or deny that the brook trout fishing has become almost world class. It's definitely top class in the US now because guys are catching sevens, almost up to eight pounders brook trout in the winter through the ice. Don't know how many days I'm gonna make it this trip. I really don't have anything planned, so hopefully the fishing's good and the weather doesn't kill me. Stay tuned, guys. I think this is gonna be a really good trip. And don't forget to say hi to Pete. Hi. I came in to, to ask the guys who might know a lot more than me, I'm sure they do, what's open, what's closed. We're gonna find out. All right guys, I wanna fish Lily Bay. Do you know what's open or closed? Cause I really did not know what's going on in there. Yeah, so just the section, the narrows between Sugar Island and Beaver Cove uh, is what they've gathered to be the new spawning area, which is where most of the people were catching the huge like four to seven pound brook trout. So the state closes it down as soon as you start catching them? Yeah. Well, Moosehead's gained a lot in popularity due to social media. Sure. And we're getting way more fishermen up here than we ever have before. And we're just trying to keep the lake, you know, producing, Bigger you know, yep. Yep, trying to keep the breeder, the breeding population. So that's completely so. close to all fishing? Yeah. Yep. There's a little, uh, like a little four dots. You could draw on that if you want one. Basically that section right there. Like okay, the south, cool. Southeast tip. Southeast and tip. I, and I know up here by the toe of the boot has always been uh, like a spawning ground as well. That's closed. Um, yep. And I know people can fish during the summer in Spencer Bay, but it's always been closed in the winter time. I assume it might be another hatching spot. Um, yeah. Yeah, gotcha. All right, cool. I think you sent me into Spencer Bay last year when I was like, where's a good spot to brook trout fish? And you were like, Spencer Bay, baby. And I was like, yes. During the summer. No, it was in the no, winter. Anyway. But you were, you were just kidding, or the other guy was, yeah. or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we're probably. It was pretty funny, messenger. actually. I was like, okay, cool, Spencer Bay. And then somebody's like, no. And I noticed you've got the Moose River marked off here. Is that closed, do you know? It's not closed, but it's just not anywhere you want to go near in, yeah, the, in the winter time. That's where we always lose someone every year. Oh, really? Because the river comes into the into the lake there, and yeah, it's always the thin ice around there. there. Gotcha, um, okay. Another spot you don't want to go is a hard scrabble point. Okay. Um, there's like a current that comes through here, um, and this spot's always dangerous. Awesome. Right, right on the north tip of Kineo. So that's a no-no. This is yep. you said in front of Moose. The Moose River is a no-no. Yeah. And the lake on on the backside of Kineo right here can be sketchy, um, but when it is finally solid, it's really good fishing up in there. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, summer and winter. What do you What have you guys heard for conditions so far this year? Uh, well, I know they put the markers out between um, Rockwood and Kineo, so there's at least ten inches there. Gotcha. Yeah. Like the markers for the snowmobile trail. Yep. Okay, yep. cool. And the guy won't go out there unless there's at least 10 inches. Nice. So, you know? <laughs> cool. Right around Deer Island, Moose Island, that's where I've been fishing lately, and there's good foot plus right in there. Oh, nice. Yeah. And those markers are actually pinned out where the area is blocked off. Yeah, aren't there big red signs yeah. or something? Okay, you could actually yeah. see them? Yeah. Because I was reading Definitely. a book, man. I was having the hardest time with the laws because it was like, yeah. Ernest Borgnine's yeah. property, yeah. and this red marker in a tree, yeah. and this red marker. You also marker. have to let go any brook trout that's between 18 and 22 inches, which yeah. is part of that whole breeding population, like the major breeders. Nice. Um, but the smaller ones are better eaten, you know? Anywhere yeah. tucked in this little cove about Deer Isle, uh, Deer Isle will be pretty good too. This um, area is all open be, to fishing? You'd be yeah. pretty sheltered in that yeah. nook right there. Yeah, so I'd say they're right in that little spot right there this side of sugar. Mm -hmm. Sweet, and then like as far as, if I am brook trout fishing and I wanna go out for togue or cusk, is this area deep yeah. enough or? Yeah, there's. Okay. Just go out a little ways. Yeah. Well, you were fishing in like 60, 60 foot water. 80, 60 to 80 feet, yeah. For togue? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah. Jigging? I did jig, but I caught most of them on the traps. I had a couple of hits jigging. But... Yeah. Any good togue? 
Uh, one was like four pounds that we got. So nice. Yeah. Any big cusk? Uh, we didn't get any big cusk. But Somebody weighed one. I weighed one the other day. Somebody brought in that was five and a half pounds. Yeah. Gee, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. He caught a 14 or was it 12 or 14 pounder Something last like year. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently that's he's got awesome. a spot. Uh, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. If you guys want to fish this week, come out and find me. I'll have a red Eskimo 450i. Yep. Um, oh, yeah. Old Panther, little 370 snowmobile. Yep. And obviously yep. me. Yeah. And it'll be set up if you guys want to fish. The 15th, you can start yeah. keeping salmon. Okay, before that is Snip Snip. Yep. Snip Snap, yeah. Snip Snap, Snip Snap. Yep. And uh, the new tog rule is you can catch any tog under 18 and keep as many as you want. Okay, as many as you want under 18. 18 and only one over 18. That's a good law. Yep. Cool. Um, any other advice, guys? Like, uh, does it have to be smelt? Shiner's working good? I would do a mix. Yeah, I'd mix do a it mix. Up. I've been catching most of my tog actually on shiners this year, but smelt definitely do work. Um, nice. Shiners stay alive a little bit longer, too. Yeah, they're a lot more durable. Brookies yeah. does it same thing. Mix it uh, up. I'd use a small smell for brookies personally. Small. Yeah. Okay. Smaller bait for brookies, yeah. bigger bait for togue. You guys selling smell? Yeah. Do you have smell? Yep, we have both. Shiner. Nice. Yep. I'll buy some smell from you for sure. Yeah. All right, great. See, that's why you like to stop at the local bait and tackle shops, man. Support the local businesses anyway. These are the guys that are donating to the fish and derbies and the youth clubs and the boy scouts and, and all the bass clubs and the trout clubs and the motorcycle clubs and the snowmobile clubs. And these are the guys that are helping the locals, also helping the community. So I like to support them obviously as well, being a small business owner myself. I'm glad I stopped because they gave me the info that there's quite a bit more area open than I thought. So it's just that square that's closed off. And I guess it's easy to see because there's big red markers that's closed. We'll go look for those. But I could fish this area and I could fish around deer. And with the northwest wind coming in, I'm probably going to try to tuck behind deer like he said. And maybe whale on a big brookie over there. All right, got the first load loaded up. Normally I go out empty and find a spot and make sure everything's safe, but there's a bunch of shacks out there. I got a good report on ice, so I'm guessing it's safe. And I'm kind of, I put myself a little bit behind the eight ball here because it's really late in the day. You could see that sun setting over there. And I have less than two hours to get out there, get two loads out there and get set up. and prepared for the night the temperature's dropping we're down to single digits right now not counting the wind the wind is ripping out there i'm gonna go set up behind one of those two islands and hopefully be in the lee at least for tonight tomorrow i'll probably get hit with wind that's all right because the rest of the week i'll be in the lee made it out um found a nice little island here that i think i'll be sheltered from the northwest wind if I set up right here, it definitely sheltered from the west. And I'm thinking it'll also be sheltered from the north, which is that way. So if I tuck in here, I should be okay. I like this tree here. I'm not going to go right underneath the tree because I read a book once called To Build a Fire by Jack London. And I don't need any big chunks of snow or trees falling on me either. So 
I'm gonna set up here. Looks like a pretty good spot to fish. Looks like I'll be in the lee a little bit too. So looks pretty, pretty safe here. I'm gonna dig it out, make sure I got something nice to set up on. And then I am gonna unload this load and run back. Conditions, there's a ton of like super powder that's been drifted up, drifted up, drifted up. So you hit that and there's a lot of bumps coming out. And I, def I hit like, I don't know, eight or 10 slush pockets, which isn't bad because I, I easily made like a five mile run. So I'm gonna unload, go back, get the next load and then set up. Hopefully I'll be set up before dark. All right, all unloaded. Looks like I'm gonna have a decent spot right there. I'll dig that out when I get back. Nice flat spot. This is all the stuff. Uh, I hate that I have to leave it. Generally hunting and fishing, most of the guys are decent and understanding. So, and it doesn't look like there's anybody out here today anyway. So I'm gonna run back five, six miles, I think. I'll click the odometer and see how far it really is and get the second load of stuff, the last load of stuff, and then set up for the night, hopefully before dark. Second load is loaded up. Definitely, definitely slacking today. I'm pushing it on, on setting up in the dark and it's not good to do that. You wanna get here a lot earlier. I screw around too long in the bait shops and stuff like that. Hopefully I make it all the way back with no problems and I get set up for the night before dark. Not good, fellas. Not good. Freaking buried her. Can't get her out. Wicked deep slush. I'm gonna walk back. And well, guys, not good. Not good at all. I did not make it back in. I made it about a mile out into the lake. I couldn't find my trail or the other trails because the wind was blowing so hard it was drifting over. And I hit a friggin' pocket of slush that had 10 or 12 inches of snow and then 10 or 12 inches of slush. So I was up to my knees, buried the sled, dug and dug and dug. And of course my shovel was in with my first load of gear. So I was digging hands and boots and lifted the sled as much as I could, but I, I could not free it up. I moved it like 10 feet in an hour. And around the time it got dark, I decided to walk out and and she didn't know what I was going to do about my sled because it's now it's zero degrees and I figured that'd be the end of that but luckily I saw a guy on my way in that waved to me and I was walking back and he was outside and I I talked to him and man he and a buddy of his they're probably in their 70s both from New Jersey a guy named Jack and a guy named Skip that live up here now for the winters they came out with two sleds and and towed me out of that slop hole and towed my gear out of that slop hole and it's a little bit after 7 p.m right now but i'm heading to greenville i left half my sleeping bag my bed everything's already in there by that island so i got nowhere to sleep tonight and i can sleep in the truck but i don't even have anything dry or warm to sleep in so I'm gonna head into Greenville and see if there's a, a room for the night in there. And then in the morning, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a plan for the morning, but I guess I'm gonna go in. I left my sled at Jack's house with the, all the gear so I didn't have to unpack everything, then load it back up tonight, and then unload it in the morning. He was super kind and let me leave it there. I'm gonna unload all the stuff in the morning, go in dry, get my stuff out of there, try to find another place to fish that doesn't have any slush. I hit a couple small slush pockets that first trip, but they weren't bad at all and they were kind of frozen. So I didn't even worry about it. But this second trip, man, I hit one that just it pretty much, well, didn't quite ruin the night, but it made for a interesting story at least. But yeah, you can see me, I'm frozen. It's, uh, it's negative five degrees now, actually, now that the truck's moving. My knees down is just straight ice, two inches of ice all the way around both pant legs they weigh 100 pounds and bad bad scene that was a bad move on my part going in so late was really the worst part about it if i was early in the morning 
I'd have had all day in daylight to try to figure my way out. It might not have changed anything, but and maybe I loaded that sled a little too heavy, but it doesn't matter. Once you go through that slush and break through that crust layer that I didn't know I, there was all that slush under me, then it's just game over. Next year, I am buying a new sled or a sled with a wider track and more flotation. You know, this, this sled's been really good to me, but I know they make a lot better stuff that'll keep you high and dry, and I'm definitely getting older and fatter and out of shape, and I can't even lift this sled up. All right, that looks like a pretty good place for that to hang for a couple hours. No way that dries out by tomorrow. It was stretching out the straps. Yeah, filming on the iPad. All my GoPro stuff is out there. I had one GoPro on me when I got stuck and during the whole fiasco about getting it out. And of course the battery was dead and all my batteries are sitting in on an island somewhere that I think's a certain island, but now I'm even second guessing that. So I gotta make a plan for tomorrow whether I dare to try to get back into that spot to fish it with more gear or do I go back in dry and empty and try to pull everything out and find an easier place to fish. Oh man, it's never easy, never easy. And I haven't even gotten to the hard part yet. <laughs> the hard part's dealing with the cold, but I'm not gonna deal with the cold tonight. Well, it is pretty cold in here, but yeah, let's take a little look around. Nice. Good enough. Wicked good enough. Normally, I have no problem sleeping in my truck, and I would do it tonight too, but I don't have a sleeping bag. I don't have a pillow. I don't have a bed. I don't even have really dry clothes, so, you know, I've spent a lot of time sleeping in my truck. When I fished the tour, I probably slept in my truck over 200 nights between hunting and, and um, fishing the tour. When I Before I started staying with... Uh, JT and Brian and those guys. So I have no problem really sleeping in my truck. It's just, you gotta have certain levels of comfort. And Man, this is like the biggest fail. Major, major fail. But it could have been an even bigger fail if I didn't get out and if my snowmobile was still sitting in that two foot of slush out there right now. Very thankful for that. Gotta order some food, get some food in my belly. So I got some power tomorrow to make better decisions. downtown Greenville. I ordered me some food from the Dockside Inn and Tavern. Some kind of mini pizza that sounded pretty fancy and a salad if you can believe it or not. It's time for me to start eating a hell of a lot more salads because I should have done a better job trying to get that sled out today and another you know mile and mile and a half walk to get out and I was tired. I'm tired right now but here we go. That's a big beer. Does it? it oh, yeah. It smells good. I think you'll be perfectly awesome. happy, buddy. Awesome. Thanks again, bud. Have a good night. You too. I hope that's as good as it looks and smells. Got a Caesar salad that ended up being tossed because I tossed it. I dropped it and went right through the air. And of course, it opened up. And that's just the way the night's going. So I had to scrape it up off the parking lot. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Oh, well, it'll add some flavor. But this pizza looks amazing. And then I don't drink, but the guys would not take any money that helped me out. I, They were even a little offended that I tried to, to make them take some money. So I did find out that they drink Bush Light, and that's where they were heading to go before I ruined their night. And they said they ended up having a lot of fun, actually. So so I found that out. So they're each going to get a, a, a 12-er of Bush Light. That's the only... Bush Light I could find in town. I went to two different stores and and uh, first, and then the third one had it. So that's all that was left, and they're going to get it. So I had some dinner, got a little uh, food in my belly, and also took a little time to reflect and make a game plan for tomorrow. Times like this, you think sometimes about giving up, saying, screw it, I'm going to try to go get my stuff and just go home. But you got to look at it this way, man. You're going to get setbacks on any trip. Anything you do in life, you get setbacks. 
It's what you do after those setbacks and how you react to them that matters. That's what's going to set the tone for the rest of your life or what happens the next time you get in trouble or the next time you get a setback or the next time something bad happens. So let's look at the bright side here. Bright side is my sled is not freezing solid into a block of ice tonight like it would have if we didn't get it out. Super, super lucky and fortunate there. The other thing that's cool is I got all my stuff up here. Half of it's already out there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to fish the same spot I want to because of the fact that I don't know if I can get there <laughs> with more stuff. So hopefully I'll be able to get my other stuff out of there. Hopefully nobody finds it tonight or tomorrow morning before I get there and it's like, oh, uh, free stuff. That would suck. That's the risk you take making two trips and doing it alone. So hopefully it's all still there and it doesn't walk away. Tomorrow I get a fresh start. You know, tonight I get to do something I've never done on one of these ice fishing trips. I get to take a hot shower if there's hot water in this place. I got to eat a pizza. You know, those are those are pluses. And it's not five below inside. It's pretty cold, but it's not five below. But also in reflection, uh, it's a really a good time to look at some of the mistakes I made today. Biggest mistake, obviously, is to me, and this is could be coming from maybe being a little cocky, getting a couple of these trips under my belt, is taking, really taking my time getting up here. And, you know, I should have packed everything last night in the truck rather than this morning. I should have gotten my snowmobile plugs and lights yesterday instead of today. I should have just kind of gone with a little bit more urgency to get up here and get out here during the daylight when things are, are a lot easier to move around, easier to see, and you might run into more people in case you something does happen. So definitely, definitely my bad on that. That won't happen again. You know, I had enough time if things went smoothly, but <laughs> the second you start expecting things to go smoothly, guess what? They ain't gonna. Second thing is definitely my equipment. You know, everybody says you gotta get a bigger sled, you gotta get a better sled. Yes, you are right. Right now, I can't afford a better sled. Can't afford a bigger sled. I'm new to sledding. I got this one at a great deal. It's been good to me. You know, it's not breaking down and stuff. It's just a little narrower track. It doesn't have huge paddles on it, and it doesn't have a lot of power. So sometimes it will fall down in the slush quicker than if I had a new sled with like a 20-inch track and, and, a, and a lot more power just to punch you out of there. So, you know, next year, I'll, I'll, I'll see what I can do about getting into a lot better sled for next year. The third thing is I could have done a little bit better job staying closer to shore. Maybe there's a lot less slush closer to shore, but, you know, I thought I was good because I did that trip out and back and just hit like a couple small little slush patches that might have been like this deep, I thought. But it, it turns out there was like a foot of slush underneath those that I didn't know about. So, and then taking that super heavy load out too. I shouldn't have taken all that stuff. I, I got a little cocky, you know, when you get cocky, you pay. So, you always got to think worst case scenario and then plan plan for that and then go from there. So, you know, it cost me a mile and a half walk out of there. It cost me a full day and, you know, who knows what tomorrow's going to bring. But the plan, I got to replan tomorrow, you know, whether I try to fish that area or fish the new area. I'm going to see about maybe fishing a little closer spot, a little easier to get to, a little less risky to get to. Tomorrow I'll look at that and then... If I can, go get my gear and bring that back to the new spot. Or I see what I could do about maybe bringing a half load in and then just getting more, getting another trip and coming back for the rest of it, making two trips and really beating down a trail and finding out where the slush is and really trying to avoid those spots. Because the spot where I dumped all the stuff, I think it's a really good fishing spot for one. And two, it's out of the wind, which is key. Guys, thanks for tuning in. Sorry I didn't get all that footage today of me getting buried. I'll see if I can maybe send the drone up if it's not too windy tomorrow and show you the pictures of what it looks like now. It's, I'm sure it's a disaster out there. Hopefully this trip turns around. You know, it's not starting on a great, great path, but it could be way, way worse. Anytime things aren't going well, always remember that. It could be way worse.